عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله عز وجل في القرآن الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن الناس من يبخل ويأمرون الناس بالبخل وأعتدنا للكافرين عذابا مهينا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Giving stands as one of the most imperative aspects of a human being's life that indeed if you were to put together a bunch of qualities which could serve as indicators of one's internal being because when you look at somebody you and I don't know what's happening on the inside because you and I know that man is very good at putting up a mask you will see some people his character is consisted of at least 42 50 maybe some 100 masks and he's mastered the art of putting up a different mask in every different setting Quran comes and warns us of such people he says when they're with you قالوا إنا معكم yes once they're before you they say yes we are with you ولما خلوا إلى شياطينهم once they go back to their shayateen not to their friends not to their humans not to their family they go back with their fellow satans and devils they go back to them and they start to speak ill about you how many people have I noticed in my life and have you noticed in your life before you he says one thing and behind you he says something else how about that one man where he would come to our first imam he would tell him ya amir al-mu'mineen you are this and you are that he would praise him and praise him that's why imam comes and says man madahaka dhabahaka he who praises you has beheaded you right he who praises you in other words he's beheading it's the one who comes and criticizes you it's the one who comes and notices your flaws with a con regardless of his intention yes and that's why you should chase the words of your enemies more than the chase, more than uh, the words of your friends. However, you come and notice that one man, he would come to Imam Amir al Mu'mineen, he would tell him, Ya Ali, you are this, you are that, anta ant, you are you. He said, what do you mean you are you? He tell him, you, anta, you are Allah, you are the greatest. On one incident, Imam Amir al Mu'mineen would come down from his very horse, he would put his face on the dirt, and he would tell himself, Ma ana illa abdun min abidi Muhammad. I'm nothing but a slave of the slaves of Muhammad. But in this incident, look at what he said. He came and he told him, Ya hadha, O oh so and so, I am more than what you think and less than what you say. Isn't that the case? I'm more than what you think of me, I'm less than what you say. Why? Because insan, as Allah dedicated an entire chapter to such human beings, Surah Al-Munafiqoon, the chapter of hypocrites, yes? وَإِذَا رَأَيْتَهُمْ تُعْجِبُكَ أَجْسَامُهُمْ وَإِنْ يَقُولُوا تَسْمَعَ لِقَوْلِهِمْ كَأَنَّهُمْ خُشُبٌ مُسَنَّدَ Look at the words of Allah. He says, when you see them, you're impressed by their bodies. You're impressed by their exterior. You're impressed by the way he walks, by the way he speaks. Long beard, yes. Miswak, even when he's sleeping, he's doing miswak, yes. Even when he's sleeping, he's worried about his oral hygiene, alhamdulillah. Yes, but he forgets his, the hygiene of his heart and the hygiene of his mind and the hygiene of his worldview. All of that is secondary, but my teeth, my teeth, ya Allah, my teeth. These kinds of people, what do you notice? When you look at him, his body impresses you. Once they speak, the can is opened up. Yes, the can looks fantastic. You open it up, you wish you never opened it up. Once they speak, you hear that which they have to say. What are they? Who are they? They are what? Hollow pieces of wood. See, sometimes when you speak to a crowd, not you, sometimes you speak to a crowd, you feel as if you're speaking to wood. Yes. 
You feel as if you're speaking to Khashab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, such people, Khashabun, not only would hollow pieces of wood, يعني, you knock it, you hear elevator music. There's some people, yes, you shake him, you hear elevator music. There's some people, yes, that's why they say, but he speaks the most, he's the most vocal in the community, he has the, uh, he has the speaking abilities of Hitler. Yes, you look at him, what does he come and tell you? Yes. And a, a empty barrel makes the most noise. Unfortunately, this is the problem that we face in this world today, the 21st century. We're so advanced, we've reached the moon, but still we realize the intellectual are the most quiet and the most doubtful and the most hesitant and the most calculated. However, the dumbest are the most vocal. The dumbest are the ones speaking. In other words, you come and notice what? If you were to put together a number of qualities which tell us of the insides of... We don't know what's happening on the inside. As we said, we've mastered the art of of, what, of of faking it. Yes, fake it till you make it. You see, some people reach the highest levels in policy, the highest levels of government, because what? They just, they faked it. They, if you act like it, people will start to believe in you, and that's how this world works, unfortunately. You come and you notice what? You come and you notice that if you were to put a number of qualities together, that you come and allow you to come and see a number of things which tell you what's happening on the inside of human being, then you realize that giving is on top of the list to show us the goodness of one's interior. Are you with me or no? It shows you the goodness of the inside of a human being. Giving. And that's why I remember Amy, Amy Carmichael, who was one of the most successful Christian missionaries in India. Amy, what did she say? Amy came and said that indeed you do not have to give to love. Yes? But you have to, in other words, you don't have to love to give, but you have to give to love. Yes, if you love someone, you must give. There's no relationship with sacrifice. Like that one guy, when he was sitting in the mosque, Mawlana comes and says that in Akhirah, you will be with your wife. He got up and left. He told him, Habibi, come back, come back. What's your problem? Mawlana, I go to Jannah because I'm trying to get away from that lady. Yes. Mawlana, please, Mawlana, go and check the narration. Is it valid? He told him it's valid. The Rasulullah says, I have a number of wives. I want to be with Khadija. Khadija. So therefore, you notice there is no love without sacrifice. Amy was getting to a point. She might be a Christian. She might be a missionary. However, you notice that there was a true sentiment to the words and a true resonation to the words of indeed... Um, of Amy, therefore, you notice we want to look at today, what's the relationship between Islam and giving? Why? Number one, because as we said, Arba'in paradigm is a continuous circle. Yesterday we looked at service of the people. Today we look at giving. The importance and the relationship between giving and Islam. That number one, Arba'in is a paradigm. Arba'in is this continuous circle that never stops and never gives up. He never gives up. It continues going in circles and circles until what? Until you notice that from it a number of values and a number of fruits start to grow. Yes, giving, service. Giving is one of the most important. So therefore, we want to look at number one, what is the fuel behind giving? Number one. Number two, what is the relationship? Between man and God, what is the recipro reciprocity? The reciprocity that exists between man and God, number two. And number three, what is the link between giving and vision? Therefore, when we look at these three di dimensions, we have a better view of what's the relationship between Islam and giving. Number one, you come and look at the following discussion of what? The discussion of it being the fuel behind giving. What's the fuel behind giving? When you come and you tell yourself, what's the fuel behind giving? You're asking yourself, what is the impetus? Everything has an impetus. Everything has a what? As a pushing factor. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Allah was behind him. And a car needs fuel. A human being needs food. Yes. Bad weather, bad attendance. You notice there's a what? There's an impetus behind everything. You agree? Therefore, when you come and you look at the impetus behind giving on the 10th of Muharram of Imam Hussein made an unbelievable statement. Imam Hussein alayhi salam turns to Allah. He tells him, Oh Allah, Allahumma khudh minni hatta tarda. Oh Allah, take from me until you're satisfied. Imam al Hussein didn't say, I'm giving you until you're satisfied. No. He said, take from me until you're satisfied. What is, this, what is the suggestion and the impl impl uh, implication here? He didn't say, I give you until you're satisfied. No. He said, I am, in other words, he said, take from me. Why? Because it was originally yours. Do you know how many people he struggles to pull out a few bucks from his pocket when, he, when that basket comes in? Why? He thinks it's his. He's, he's foolish. Allah, Imam Hussein didn't say, I'm giving you. He could have said, Allahumma inni u'atika hatta tarda. 
Oh Allah, I'm going to give you, which is very plausible, which is very plausible. Makes sense. He said, oh Allah, take from me until you're satisfied. Why? Because it's originally yours. It's yours, ya Allah, number one. My life is for Allah. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyai wa mamati lillah. My life, my death, my salah, Ibrahim salam Allah alayhi wa He said, it's yours. Yeah, and it's not mine initially. Who am I to be miserly with my values? Who am I to be miserly with my resources? You find many people, he finds that stinginess is too big of a role in his life. Like Mansur al-Dawaniqi. Mansur al-Dawaniqi, the Umayyad Caliph in the time of our sixth Imam, who ended up burning his house and leading to the death of sixth Imam. Mansur was known for his stinginess. His miserliness was like, None, no one else Until one day they say that Mansoor would sit on a minbar Like I am right now He would sit down And a number of people would come to him And they would begin to recite poetry You see where I'm coming from They would begin to recite poetry Until he would then tell them If somebody has your poetry memorized Then I'm not going to give you money What would you do? He would put two professional slaves behind the curtain And they would start to recite and recite and recite And they're sitting there memorizing it Anyone has it memorized? Yes, two slaves Coincidentally, you have two professional memorizers behind the curtain They pop out of nowhere And they begin to speak of the memorized poetry Until one guy came in by the name of Isba'i Now if their poetry wasn't memorized, what happens? He tells them, give me your paper that you wrote the poem on. I'm going to weigh it and I'm going to give you the amount of gold of, of, of the way of your paper. Isba'i comes. He says, you know, I'm a fool of the system. I'm going to be smarter than the system. I'm going to memorize a number of poems which can be impossible for you to memorize them. Words which are very difficult. Isba'i pops up one day. He comes in. He recites the words, something, something that sounds like Ardala Baldala Haldala, something like that. No idea what he was saying. He goes Ardala Baldala Haldala. He starts to recite the Hardala until he tells him, where do you find Anyone has it memorized? Two professional slaves come back. We don't know, we don't know. It's too difficult. He tells them, fine, give me your paper. He says, you see that big black rock over there? I wrote my poem on that big black rock. Mansur wasn't able to sleep that day. He might have seen shimmer in his dream. He might have, I don't know what happened. Just like when you eat halim, I see shimmer in my dream. When I eat halim, I see shimmer. Sometimes I see Umar ibn Sa'ad. Sometimes I see some other people. Halim does that to you. He, indeed, it was money. <laughs> it was money which would give him a heart attack. You take my money, you take my heart. Yes. Nothing but money. That's why Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, yes, deal with your money and make sure uh, that you're, you deal with money. In other words, you know, like a, a human above the earth. Yes, because the minute you're, you become below the earth, that means you're in your grave. Therefore, what do you know? You notice that indeed, number one, mildness and stinginess. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, what did he say? He said, Allahumma khudh minni. It's an unbelievable paradigmatic point that the Imam is making. There's a paradigmatism to the words of our Imam. He said, Oh Allah, take from me until you're satisfied. Ya Allah, take from me until you are satisfied. Now I'm giving you because it's originally yours. I have nothing to do with my head. I have nothing to do with my six month year old baby. Hence, when Ali Azgar was butchered, three pronged arrow that they asked Harmala, when, when, when what's his name, Mukhtar caught him, he told him, Who did you kill and why did you kill them and how did you kill them? He said, I threw seven arrows, four landed, one, 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 one in the tents of Zainab, one, one in the chest of Hussein, one, one, for example, in the yes, right eye of Abel Fadl. He said, the, the fourth one went into the neck of Ali Azgar. He said, I took out a normal arrow. I said, It didn't do justice. I took out a three pronged arrow, which we used to butcher the head, the neck of camels. He says, I took it, that three-pronged arrow, I pierced it at the neck of Ali Azgar. I saw him pull out his hands like a butchered bird. And anyways, he took that blood, Aba Abdullah, he threw it in the air. Six Imam says, blood didn't come down. Why? Because it was originally for Allah. It goes back to Allah. We're returning the rental car, brothers and sisters, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once we die, we're simply returning the car back to the rental. We live our hands at this level. You can't harm yourself. It's not your body. You cannot be miserly with your money. It's not yours. You can't be miserly with your potential. You can't be greedy. Many people have potential. They don't show it. Or you'll know some people, unbelievable. He has great ideas. He has great plans. He's scared to say it. Because maybe his neighbor might take it from him. And this is the greatest injustice we do to ourselves. Allah says, give, give, give. Keep on giving. Because it's originally what? It's originally mine. I'm testing you to see if you give. Look at the verses and the narrations that support this notion. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتِ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ Look at the verse. Powerful verse. Allah says, don't consider those who died for the sake of Allah as dead. No, they're not dead. They're alive receiving sustenance. 
You're going to come and argue. Anyone in his sane mind is going to come and argue that Imam al Hussein is dead? You tell me you're stupid. You've lost it. Imam Hussein is dead? Or, for example, Zainab has died? You can't make such statements. No. Or, for example, Shaheen Muhammad Baqir al Sadr has died. Shaheer Nimr Baqir al Nimr of Saudi has died. No, no. They were born when they were killed. If anything, yes. Therefore, what do you notice? You notice that Allah says, don't consider those who died in the sake of Allah as dead. No, they're alive, seeking sustenance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or for example, you find what? You find that indeed, um, on one level, you notice that Rasulullah one day would come to Aisha. When I say give, because it's originally not yours, what do I mean? I mean, now what you tend to realize here is that the more you give, the more you have. It's also a paradigm shift. Many people think when he gives, he's lost. No, 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 it's not true. The more you give, the more you have. Look at, for example, one day, the Holy Prophet of Islam comes to Aisha. He tells her, Aisha, did they sacrifice that sheep I told you to sacrifice? She said, yes, I sacrificed it. He said, fine. What has stayed from the sheep? She said, Ya Rasulullah, the shoulder. He said, everything has stayed except for the shoulder. I need you to realize this narration. Everything has stayed except for the shoulder. Meaning what? Everything is gone except for the shoulder. In other words, everything has stayed except for the shoulder. Meaning what stays in your pocket indeed has, uh, has, is, is gone. And what is given has stayed. It's different. Don't consider those who died for the sake of Allah as dead. They're alive receiving sustenance. You can't consider anyone who gives. As one who has lost. That's why there's this beautiful quote. It says, there's some people, they're so poor, all they have is money. Yes. There's some people, they're so poor, all they have is money. What does the hadith come and say? Yes, they give, they give, and that's why they have. They have. Miserliness and stinginess. I remember once Sahal ibn Sa'ad al-Sa'adi, he narrates that I made a wool cloak for the Holy Prophet of Islam because it's a great idea to give Mawlana's presence. Anyways, it is said that he would what? He would make a cloak he takes this cloak and he gives it to Sahel. Fine. He gives it to he gives it to the Prophet. Black and white cloak, beautiful. You know, Abba. The Prophet was known to dress beautifully. He had turbans. He had names for his turbans. He would say that he would give him a cloak. He would take the cloak and he would wear it until one Arabic Bedouin. You know these Bedouins. They want everything. He sees the cloak of the Prophet. He tells him, "I want that cloak." Prophet takes it off, gives it to him. This was the nature of Ahl al Bayt. Their nature was giving. They walk and give. They walk and give. Because they realized what they realized, the more they give, that the more they have. You can't come and argue that once you give, you don't have. No, no, it's the exact contrary. The more you give, the more you have. And this is what Ahl al Bayt السلام, have taught us day in, day out. In other words, you give, you have. And that's why, what do you notice? You notice indeed one day our Imams, alayhum salam, they give, they give, they give. And that's where you look at, for example, somebody like Hatim al Ta'i. Hatim al Ta'i was a companion of some say seventh imam. He was a kafir, but he was generous. He's an icon of generosity in the Arab world. He's known, Hatim, you ask any Arab, who's the icon of generosity in the Islamic world? He tells you Hatim al-Ta'i. Hatim al-Ta'i would invite imams for, for dinner, for food. He, they would feed them, but he was a kafir. A hadith come and say, he'll be in Jahannam, but he'll be in a bubble where he'll only be faced by the psychological pains of Jahannam. Physically, he'll be away. Now, it's difficult to make this argument that a kafir will make it into Jannah, or for example, pluralism, what does Islam say about such things? That's a different discussion. However, for the most part, you notice Hatim, one narration says, he'll be in Jahannam, but he'll be what? He'll be in this psychological. Anyways, that's the first notion. Number one. Number two, when you speak of the link between... Um, or in other words, the reciprocity between man and God. There is a reciprocal relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and insan. When I say reciprocal, in what way? Reciprocal means you give me, I give you. You look at, for example, in psychology, they teach us of reciprocal or altruism. They say there's a number of altruism in psychology. For example, you have balanced reciprocity. I give you $2, you give me $2. I give you $2, you give me a product which is worthy of $2. There's what? There's general reciprocity, which you might find in Iraqi culture. I, I, I get a haircut, when am I going to pay him? Maybe next year, maybe next week. It's called general altruism. I don't know. I give you, I'm not sure when I'm going to get my money back. I might never get it back, like my dad. Anyways, you come and you notice that indeed general altruism, that's one thing. And then you have what? <laughs> you come and you notice this discussion of what? Of of reciprocal. Reciprocal means what? It's close to balance. However, I give you and you give me. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on one level, there's something which is called divine altruism, which I'm introducing. Divine altruism, which is what? Divine altruism is I give you this much, I give you 10 times more. Take one step towards me, I take 10 steps towards you. Yes, give one dollar for me. Man Allah qardan hasanan fayudha'ifhu lah. Who's going to make a trade with me? Allah says in the Quran, I'm, I'm hungry. I need people to work with me. I need businessmen with me. Help me out. Allah says, give me a dollar. I give you ten dollars. Or put a hundred, I double it into a thousand. This is divine, the divine altruism. Reciprocal altruism is, is very, reciprocity is the link between us and God. Remember me, I'll remember you. And the more you remember me, the more I remember you. Yeah, if you're a successful businessman, apply that mentality with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Apply it with God. Apply it with Him. See what happens. I give you, you give me. Remember me. I remember. That's how things work with God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a reciprocal Lord. That's the way He works. He comes and He tells you, I give you and you give me. Remember me. I'll remember you. And the more you remember me, the more I'll give you. Jesus walked on water. They would say, did Jesus walk on water? Yes. Rasulullah says, if he had more iman, he would have walked on air. It's reciprocal. See, some people have tawfiq. Yeah, because he's always remembering God. Allah won't forget you. Now look, Allah, azkurkum. Allah says, remember me, I remember you. That's one thing. You have another one, what's his problem? Nasawullahum and Fusahum. They forgot Allah, they forgot themselves. Your relationship with yourself as well is reciprocal to your relationship with God. You look at our Imams, they were able to do fascinating things. Why? Because of their relationship with God. Imam Kazim alayhi salam one day, Imam Kazim alayhi salam, he's indeed in the room with Harun al-Rashid. He sees a picture of a lion. It is said that there was a magician. The magician would come, he would zap the piece of bread before the Imam. Imam would be humiliated, people laugh at him. Imam reaches for the bread, the bread disappears. Until it is said that people would laugh at him. He looks at a picture on the wall. He sees that there is a lion. He tells him, oh lion, come out. Hadith, this, there's no Bollywood mumbo jumbo. He tells him, oh, hi, oh, hi, oh, lion come out. Lion comes out. Lion eats the magician, man. He eats him. He eats the magician. And then Imam tells him, uh, Harun says, Spit my, uh, give me back my magician. He spits him back. Anyways, they were able to do things, splitting the sea. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen says, I am the one who split the sea from Musa. I am the one who indeed uh, uh, saved Jesus from the Jews. I softened the iron for Dawood. I, 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 I. This, were, this was the mentality of our Imams. They were able to do unbelievable things. Rips the door of Khaybar. Rips the door of Khaybar. Forty men were able to rip it. They come to him after he rips it. They see him struggling to break a hard piece of bread. They tell him, Ya Ali, anta alladhi qalahta baba Khaybar. Ali, you're the one who ripped the door of Khaybar. How do we see you struggling? You know what he says? He says, I ripped the door of Khaybar through Allah's strength. I break this piece of bread through my strength. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen was able to do these things that he did. Why? Because of his relationship with God. When I say it's a reciprocal relationship. In other words, what does this mean? This means what you give God, God gives you. It's balanced. He's your friend. Khalilullah. Ya sahibi anda shiddati wa ya waliyi fi ni'mati. We say in our narrations, in our du'as, Oh my friend, in difficult times. Oh my indeed supporter in hardship. This was the relationship that Islam established of Allah. It's a reciprocal. Therefore, when you give, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. Keep this in mind. You see, now giving means what? Giving just means money? No. Giving a smile. Al tabassum fi waji akhika sadaqa. Hadith comes and says, smiling in the face of your mu'min brother is charity. That's one thing. What else? You find, for example, giving could be giving your moral support, giving your attendance, giving, giving, giving your money. Giving comes in many different dimensions, giving your time. Wal-asr, Allah swears by time. Wal-fajri, wal-layli, yes. Wash, Allah swears by time. Time, whatever it is, give it. So that's number two, the reciprocal relationship. Number three, you come and look at the link between giving and vision. You see, many people, he says it's difficult for me to give. I'm telling you, when your vision becomes richer, when your vision becomes stronger, when your vision becomes more intense, that's how you give. If you were to draw on a graph, it's an interdependent relationship. The higher the vision, the more the giving. The vision of Ahl al-Bayt was strong. What's our vision as a Muslim ummah, brothers and sisters? There was a seminar in Israel. They say the Shia have three things that we fear. Number one, they have what? They have Hussein. They have uh, Hussein. 
Hussein died, he was still victorious. They say, how are we going to get rid of such a people? They look in the eye of the, of the, of the gun and they see paradise. Yeah, you can't kill such a people. Such a people who look in the barrel of the gun and they see paradise. You can't get rid of such a people. Hussein, Hussein died, he was still victorious. This is in Israel, the, the, horse of, the mouth of the horse. Number one, they have what? They have Hussein. Number two, they have Marja'iyah. They have pillars. They have leaders. Today, every time Dick and Harry is speaking out against Marja'iyah. Who are you, man? Since when did you have the credentials to speak about Marja'iyah? Number two. Number three, 12th Imam Mahdi. 12th Imam. Because he's the last, last, the last laugh is theirs. This is the idea of vision. Basira. Imam Sajjad or Imam Salih alayhi salam, he says, speaking about Abel Fadl al-Abbas, he says, Ashhadu anna kunta nafil al-Basira. You had a penetrating vision. His vision was unbelievable. Our vision, what's our vision 50 years down the line? Shaheed Murtaba Mutahari, he says that us Muslims were meant to know what's going to happen 50 years down the line. 50 years. 50 years. There. What's the game plan? What's the plan for the Shia youth? Our youth. There's so many competitive elements surrounding us, brothers and sisters. The clubs, the bars, the schools, TV, media, it's all against us. If anything, we have to stay together as a Muslim ummah so that we understand that the enemy is strong. The enemy is so... <coughs> shaitan? Do you think shaitan stops? <coughs> when, does, <coughs> when does shaitan stop? Shaitan doesn't stop. Wallah, he doesn't stop. The man has work ethic, unbelievable work ethic. The work ethic of shaitan doesn't stop. Allah is against him, he still continues. Allah is against him. Allah kicked him out of paradise. He expelled him from paradise. He's still going. He's still fighting. He's still going. And that's why, what do you notice? You notice that indeed shaitan's work ethic, the enemy's work ethic, they know it better than us. They know the greatness of Islam. They say that they bombed the shrine of our 11th Imam. Why? So that they can go into that shrine and get DNA from the Imam to see where 12th Imam is. Yes. They have a vision. What's our vision? Now, they say, I can't give. It's too difficult. Give, but there's a vision. There's a vision. The vision is what pushes us, brothers and sisters. Let's not be fooled by shaitan. Shaitan is working. Shaitan is working. Are we working? This giving nature of Ahlul Bayt, alayhum is is what indeed pushed them to, to attract people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet of Islam, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّنْ غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ Ya Rasulullah, Allah, if you were hard-hearted, they would have indeed what? They would have indeed flocked away from you. They would have flocked away from you, Ya Rasulullah. It was your giving nature. It was your mercy. It was your rahmah. It was your approach. You find many people, he doesn't lose the youth with content. He loses the youth with his approach. The approach of the Prophet was tender. The approach of the Prophet was merciful. One man, it is said that he was indeed dating or going out, whatever you want to call it, with another, with another guy's sister. He told him, excuse me, you imagine I was to do something with your sister. How would you feel? Yes. You tell me, Ya Rasulullah, that makes sense. Of course, I would die. It would kill me. He told him, likewise, you have to understand that that is a sister of someone else. Look at the approach of the Prophet, how he threw the ball in his court. He didn't tell him, by the way, man, you're going to burn in Jahannam. You're going to die, man. Man, I can't wait for you. You're going to be down there with the... Uh, you're going to be down there. You're going to see a bunch of celebrities. You're gonna, you can talk to them, but you'll be burning. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be toasted, man. It's going to be game over for you. Is that what he said? No, he told him, come here, come here. Imagine this was your sister. Look at the approach. Approach is key, brothers and sisters. Marketing. Marketing of our religion. Where is the marketers out there? Where is the businessmen? Where is the successful humans out there? Apply your knowledge to Islam. Don't be like the Christians. The Christians, you know what their problem is? They have a different brain when it comes to religion. They're scientists, they're doctors, they're engineers, they're lawyers, they're dentists. However, when it comes to religion, three gods equals one. How does that work? Different brain. They use different brains for religion. Don't do that. We do that sometimes. Our brain... The success that we have, the, 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 the geniusness that we have, our intelligence, our wittiness, we don't apply it to religion. We have a different brain when it comes to religion, believe me you. I don't understand why we do it, but it's a problem. We have a completely different brain when it comes to religion. Do you understand that? That's crazy. I don't know why we do that. Three equals one. How does three equal one? I was sitting in a Tim Hortons in America. Yes, in America. I was sitting in a Tim Hortons. I was eating my donut, enjoying my donut, Oreo donut. Fascinating. Go for that one next time. The Oreo donut. I was eating the Oreo donut until I see a man in front of me, Christian black man. Comes with his Bible every day. I told him, Hadji Christian, you, what are you reading? Oh, it's the Bible. Oh, really? 
We get into this discussion. I start to tell him until it, I told him, listen, man, you got to upgrade your game. You got to step up your game because you and me are on the same side. We both believe in God. Your argument is weak, man. I told him, he started laughing. I told him, your argument needs a lot of help. I'm helping you out here. He told me, oh, you're helping me out? He started laughing. I told him, yeah, yeah, I'm helping you out, man. What's your argument? I told him, Je he tells me, Jesus is the son of God. I he, told, he started telling me, believe in Jesus. I told him, don't tell me nothing about Jesus. I told him, give me one verse. I told him, okay, fine. Jesus is the son of God, right? Why is there no brother of God? Who's the brother of God? Why is there just a son? We okay, fine, fine. The uncle of God. Where's the uncle? Yes. Where's the uncle? Where's the sister? Why is there just a son? What kind, where's, your, where's the proof? I told him, give me one verse in the Bible today, right now. Which comes and says that Jesus is the son of God. I told him, Wallah, I'll leave Islam. I become a Christian today. Because I knew there's no such thing. If there was such thing, I would have ran so fast. <laughs> he told me, he told me, here you have over here. <laughs> I promise you, I kid you not. He opened up a verse which spoke about apples or pineapples. I told him, Hajji Christian, what's going on here, man? What apple? What pineapple? Show me the verse. He told, I, Wallah. After 15 minutes of discussion, he ignores me, he starts watching TV. He, he, he turned off the channel, he started watching TV. I also watch TV with him. I'm, we're watching TV, we're both watching TV. It got awkward as hell. We're both walking, we're watching TV, he's watching TV. He gets up, he, he starts laughing. After six minutes of watching TV, six minute mark, he starts laughing. <laughs> I told him, he's lost 100%. He's, 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 he, he lost his brain, what's going on? He gets up, he leaves. I told him, hey, hey, Haji. Give me my brownie points. Where are you going? He told him, I told him, you can't just give up halfway. You can't just turn off the channel. What are you doing? You can't leave. You know what he says? He's like, I need proof. I told him, what proof? Jesus is going to come in your dream today. What proof do you want? He, he, he didn't come for one week. He came the next week. Yes, he, he didn't even say salams to me. Now I can't tell you what happened with the other guy. Anyways. There's too many stories. These kinds of people, what do you notice? I don't know where I was. But look, he was marketing. Marketing of our religion. Marketing of our system. Marketing of our substance. Ya akhi, market Islam. You're a doctor connected to Islam. Where else are you going to go if not to Islam, to the religion of Muhammad? You're a businessman connected to Islam. Wallah, 12th Imam could come any moment. Why don't we understand this stuff? What's wrong with us, man? Imam could come any moment. Any moment, Imam could knock on our door. Are we ready? Wallahi, we're not ready. The religion attracted all kinds of people. Look at Imam al Hussein on the 10th of Muharram. He attracted number one. Who? Wahab ibn Abdullah al Kalbi because of the giving nature of Aba Abdullah. Wahab! Wahab ibn Abdullah al Christian man. Christian man who some say died a Christian some say he converted which is arguable I don't know but some come and say that he died a Christian wow he died a Christian fine look at this he comes to Imam he's passing he's going with his what, newlywed he's with his newlywed he sees that there's a man which is very interesting character he comes to him he tells him what's going on he says I'm the grandson of the prophet prove it some say he performed a miracle anyways he convinced him he persuaded him Ahl bayt had power of persuasion they call them Sultanul Qulub they were what? they were kings and princes of the heart this is a quality of Ahl bayt they bought your they, they knew how they knew how to buy people very 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 swiftly they were they were thieves of the heart Ahlul Bayt. they win you over anyways he comes and he tells him you uh prove it he proves it he goes and he fights as a christian man after some say a number of weeks a number of months after getting married he leaves his wife he leaves his mother he goes on to the field he's fighting he's, he's fighting he comes back he sees his wife, he sees his mother. His mother tells him, yes, Wahab, go and fight. He told him, mother, you just told me six, seven times before I went the first time, don't fight, don't fight. Now you're telling me fight. What, what happened? What changed all of a sudden? What changed? You know what she said? She said, when I heard the grandson of Rasulullah say, Ala hal min Ala hal min When I heard the words of Aba Abdullah, my heart broke into pieces. Go! Qatil duna tayyibin! Go and fight for the sake of the good ones. It is said that Aba Abdullah or Wahab goes and fights. His wife joins him. She gets hit on the head. She becomes the first female martyr on the 10th of Muharram. Christian lady. Christian dies. Look at the giving nature of Al Muhammad. Hence they attracted. Ya akhi, you have to be a universal personality. 
We're so exclusive, it's not even funny. Don't let me get started how exclusive we are as a community. We're so lost in our own bubble. We're so comfortable. We're so complacent. Oh my days. You know how comfortable we are? We're so, we're so satisfied with what we have. I made it. Who made it? Who made it? What's this discussion of I made it? There's no discussion. Give me proof where you can come and say I made it. Well, we're so satisfied. We're so, I, I don't understand. Maybe you can teach me. I don't know why we're so satisfied. I don't know why we're so happy with where we are. It's, it's, it's a stagnant. It's a, it's, it's, it's a handicap. It's, it's a complete handicap. We made it. Continue, continue thinking you're special. Look at there's a, Wahab. He attracts Wahab. Or for example, what do you see? You see that Turkish, that Turkish boy by the name of Aslam al Turki. Aslam al Turki. Imam had Christians, Imam had elderly, Anas, Imam had younger, Imam had cultures. Turkish, Turkish. Aslam al Turki. Aslam comes, he tells him, Aba Abdullah, can I fight? He gives him the permission. He goes, he fights, he gets killed until he dies. Some men say that at that point. He dies, or indeed before his death, Aba Abdullah comes to him. He puts his cheek on his cheek. Aslam begins to scream. He says, Man mithli wa khaddu ibn Rasulillah ala khaddi. He says, who's like me? And the cheek of the grandson of Rasulullah is on my cheek. This is Aslam. Or you look at that Christian man who was sent to kill Imam al Hussein. Umar ibn Sa'ad stands up. He says, who's willing to kill Hussein? Who's willing to kill Hussein? Everyone backs off. Even Shimr. Shimr, when he initially went to the, the body of Hussein to kill him, he even says, he says, I was distracted. لَقَدْ شَغَلَنِي نُورُ وَجْهِهِ عَنِ الْقَتْلِ He says, I was distracted by the light from his face. I forgot why I approached his body. Allahu Akbar. Are you with me or no? Look at, look at these unbelievable lines here. He says, I was distracted by the intention, by the light of the face of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and hence I didn't kill him. He says, I would see his mouth mumbling. What is he saying? He's saying, Ilahi, taraktu al-khalqa turran fi hawaka, wa aytamtu al-iyala likay araka, falaw qatta'tani fi al-hubbi irban, lama maala al-fuadu ila siwaka. He says, Oh Allah, I left everything for you. I left my family, my children, all for you. He tells him I was distracted. Everybody backed off. Not me, not me. Until he says, Is there a Christian man amongst us? Christian man comes. Doesn't know Hussein, doesn't know Muhammad. He can do the job easily. It's like he's cutting a chicken's head. He tells him, Go and kill him. He goes near him. He pulls his sword out, he sits on his chest. He's about to sever the neck. Imam Hussein opens up his eyes, he sees a Christian. He tells him, Akhi Nasrani, oh my Christian brother, look how they gave until their last moment. They gave everything they had. There was no pride, there was no conceit, there was no delusional thoughts. He comes and he tells him, Yes, who are you? He tells him, Akhi Nasrani, my Christian friend, have you read the Bible? He told him, yeah. He told him, did you read the line which comes and speaks of Ahmed? He says, yes. He says, did you read the name Elia? Yes. He told him, did you read the name Fatima? He says, yes. Did you read Shubbar? Yes. Did you read Shubair? He said, yes. By the way, these are all in the Bible. They were changed, right? He told him, of course I did. These are names which are respected in our religion. Kid me, kid, I kid you not. These names are revered. These are saints. Go into a Christian church. Look how they pride themselves with St. Paul, with St. John, St. Peter. You find pictures of them on the windows and so on and so forth. They pride themselves in their saints. He says, of course I know Ahmed. Of course I know Fatima. Of course I know Elia. Of course I know Shubbar. Of course I know Shubair. He says, these are my men. These are, these are, our, these are our leaders. These are our exemplars. He told him, is that the case? He told, him, yeah. he told him, oh man, let me tell you that the first name is my grandfather Muhammad. That's my grandfather. That's my prophet Muhammad. Let me tell you that second name, Fatima, is my mother. That's my mother Fatima. In my Bible? That's Fatima? No way. He says, that's Fatima in my Bible. He told him, Elia, Ali. He told him, that's my father. Ana al Hussein ibn Ali. I'm Hussein, son of Ali. He told him, how about Shubbar? He says, Shubbar is my brother, Hassan. Shubair is me. I am Hussein in your Bible. He says, you are Shubair, what can I do? He told him, take the sword and go and fight. He said, take the sword and go and fight. Christian man goes and fights for Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Christian man. Or that Christian priest who would come when the ladies and the caravan are being taken. He sees a head on the spear. Head on the spear. He comes, he asks curious question here. Who is that? Who's on that spear? They tell him that's Hussein, grandson of Muhammad. 
He says, your prophet Muhammad? He said, yes. He says, Allahu Akbar. He says, it is said that the hoof of the horse of Jesus is, has been known to step here. We put an ark on it. We put a, a mausoleum around it because that's the hoof of the horse of Jesus. You have the grandson of your prophet and you're killing him, beheaded him alive? He told him, give me the head. He told him, no way. He told him, give me the head. He said, take this money. He gives him money, he takes the head. He takes the head to his house. He puts the head of Aba Abdullah on a table. He moves the blood from the head of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. He puts scent on the head of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He kneels down on his knees. He looks at the head of Aba Abdullah. He tells him, Speak to me. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you have done. I don't know your greatness. I don't know even your value. I don't know who you are, but speak to me. It is said that a voice would come from the head of Imam al Hussein, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, it would tell him, Ana al Hussein, Ana al Gharib, Allahu Akbar. There are millions going to Karbala today, brothers and sisters. There are millions walking towards the shrine of Aba Abdullah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us. If not from the zuwar of Aba Abdullah tonight, on the, on the, in this year, then next year, or from those who are rewarded the intercession and the shafa'a of the grand. Son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. It is said that that begins to speak to him, saying, Ana ibn Ali in Il Murtawa, Ana ibn Fatima to Zara. He says, I am Hussein, son of Ali. I am son of Fatima. I am son of Muhammad. He says, What can I do to follow you? He said, Repeat after me. Ashadu Allah, 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 Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon La hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-aliyy al-azim Ilahi bil Hussein Raise your hands brothers and sisters on these nights These are the nights of Arba'in These are the nights of Sahib al-Zaman These are the nights of Fatima al-Zahra Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad اللهم اجعلنا من زوار الحسين اللهم شافي كل مريض بحق مريض كربلاء زين العابدين اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين واخذوا للكفر والمنافقين and may you jeep, brothers and sisters, three times with the loudness of our voices, Ya Allah, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء One more time أما يجيب دعاه ويكشف السوء يا الله برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين أنت أنسوا دعاء زوجي سورة الفاتحة هذه صلوات